Well, good evening and uh, welcome all. Uh, welcome to this 2017 commemoration of the University of Virginia African American Cemetery. For keep of these grounds a call to remembrance that no doubt evokes a variety of emotions among us as we are tied together here in ceremony tonight. So we thank you for being here. I'm Marcus Martin. I'm Vice President and Chief Officer for Diversity and Equity here at the University of Virginia. And I'm the co-chair of the President's Commission on Slavery and the University with Kurt Von Dyke. So thank you. And first, we owe thanks to God. And I'd also like to thank Ravana Archaeological Services and the UVA Facilities Management Team for the wonderful work they've done here. Facilities Management put the tent up for us tonight and all the lights you'll see as we process into the cemetery shortly. Um, Ravana Archaeological Services marked the African American cemeteries for us. Ben Ford was here doing that with Shepherd Hooks, and you'll see that as we progress into the cemetery in a few minutes. Uh, the Office for Diversity and Equity team, uh, you all are just awesome. They were here all day long for the symposium, then they came out and got the lights together and a number of other things. So big round of applause for the Office for Diversity and Equity team. And also the President's Commission on Slavery and the University Community Relations Task Force. Uh, they've been working very hard within the community. They are here tonight. They're serving as ushers and guides. And uh, I thank them. So another round of applause for them as well. And, and thank you all for being here and for all the people who are going to be on this program tonight. Um, just to give you a little history, uh, in advance of a proposed 2012 expansion of the University Cemetery, archaeologists identified 67 grave shafts uh, during an early phase survey. Uh, this was a grave site that had been dismissed for so many years we don't know how long, and the people buried here were forgotten. And we know, although unknown to man living today, the people buried here are known to God yeah. and were never forgotten. Yeah. They were never forgotten. And they are mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, sisters, brothers, aunts and uncles, grandmothers and grandfathers who contributed to the building and sustaining of this university and the surrounding community. And let us be reminded that we are standing on Monacan soil. Those buried here have returned to ashes and dust they have returned to be a part of the earth itself. And like the Monicans, we should never stop loving this earth, their homeland, and all the spirits that reside here. Amen. <laughs> what we found was that about 40% of the interments appeared to have been children. And only eight of the grave shafts were marked by a headstone or a footstone. However, no graves were disturbed uh, during the archaeological surveys. We noticed that the grave shafts were laid out in distinct rows, small clusters, possibly representing family units. Probably a number of people in the family died from some type of disease process. The location of these graves in the historical archives that we found suggests that the they represent a portion of the enslaved and free African Americans who labored at the University of Virginia in the early years before 1865. The actual acknowledgment of this burial site was found in an 1898 article in the UVA Alumni Bulletin, which noted, in old times, the university servants were buried on the north side of the cemetery just outside the wall. And so this is the north side that's the white cemetery, and that's the wall that you'll see when you go down. And there's a wooded area just down below. So we don't know the exact dates when the African American Cemetery was established or when it ceased to be used. But this gravesite is adjacent to, but separate from the white cemetery, and represents a sacred space 
where deceased members or deceased members of the University of Virginia African American community were buried. And it's, it's unfortunate uh, that these graves were forgotten over time. However, with rediscovery in 2012, uh, as we were planning to expand the cemetery, which by the way, ultimately the cemetery was expanded over on the south side. And I'm here to tell you that cemetery hasn't been integrated, but I can tell you, I bought two plots there. <laughs> I have two. My wife and I have two, so we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> well, we have three children who are UVA alums and uh, grandkids we'd like to see come here. And this is, we've lived here 22 years longer than we've lived anywhere else, so this is home at this time. So anyway, we had the opportunity in 2014 to preserve and appropriately commemorate the cemetery. Um, and it was a wonderful opportunity to do that. And some of the people who helped us with that uh, commemoration uh, are here again tonight. And so I'm looking forward to them speaking. So now uh, I'm honored to introduce Pastor Ricky White and the Union Run Baptist Church, REW Total Praise Choir once more. Please come up.
Amen. Amen. Now we'll have reflections, Reverend Alvin Edwards, Pastor, Mount Zion First African Baptist Church. Good evening. We thank the Lord for this day and for your presence, and we greet you in the only name that really named that matters, and that's the name of Jesus the Christ. To the president, President Sullivan, if she's here, and to all the officers, to Dr. Martin, and to to everybody who makes up this aggregation, thank you for being here tonight. Tonight, as we celebrate and honor those persons who have labored here at UVA, some paid and some not, but we are here to remember them. And as I pondered what to say, my mind traveled down memory's lane to a very familiar passage of scripture that was a prayer by Moses in Psalm 90, verse 12, where it reads, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. This is a prayer that Moses prayed where he asked the Lord to instruct, to teach, to coach, to educate him and the people of Israel on how to live their lives. Because the truth about life is that in order to live it to the fullest, to get the most out of it, you will have to make each day count. Not count the days, but live so that there are no regrets. Live in such a way that you squeeze all the life out of it. That you live so as not to rust out, but rather to wear out. And I wanted to suggest to each of you who gather to show respect, to honor those persons who have gone on before us, is to remember that all of us stand on the shoulders of those who have already gone on before us. These persons, some of whom were slaves, some paid and some not, as we reflect on their life and our lives, we should know that we stand on their shoulders. We are living off their legacies, their hard work. Even though they worked in some hard, harsh, and horrible conditions, they worked. And if they could accomplish what they did back in the day, then they have built bridges that we have crossed to bring the university and the Charlottesville community to where we are today. And my challenge to you is this. What will we leave when we move off the scene? Will you use your life to build walls or will you build a bridge? The poet Will Allen Drumgool penned these words under the poem named Bridge Builder. An old man going a lone highway came at evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fear for him. But he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man said a fellow pilgrim near, you are wasting your strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again will pass this way. You've crossed a chasm deep and wide. Why build this bridge at evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I have come, he said. There followed after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been as naught to me, to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I am building this bridge for him. We need to be a bridge builder. God bless you. Thank you, Reverend Edwards. Uh, reflections, Professor Lynn Rainville, research professor in the Humanities Sweetbriar College. So there's nothing more humbling as a speaker than trying to follow after an eloquent preacher. So my apologies in advance. So I have one simple message for you tonight, and that is to visit cemeteries more often, not as a morbid exercise, but as a way to learn from these outdoor museums of African American culture. Because cemeteries house the dead, but they are designed, built, and tended to by the living. 
This is an important distinction because this means that mortuary practices and funerary architecture tells us equally as much about the dead and the cultural as it does about the cultural traditions and the beliefs of the living. In the case of African American communities, this mortuary history is invaluable for reconstructing a more accurate picture of the strong bonds among black families and the trials that they faced during and after slavery. In the case of the African American cemetery here, the gravestones themselves reveal some of the indignities that the dead and their mourners faced. When this site was relocated in 2012, some of the markers in this graveyard had been snapped off at their bases, most likely because they had become an inconvenience to university groundskeepers, and or possibly they were an embarrassment, uh, embarrassing symbol of the men and women who had once been enslaved at the university. Because as you'll see when you go out there, if you were in the white part of the cemetery, the, the wall is a low wall, so you would easily be able to see over it if there were standing gravestones marking the burials of African Americans on the other side. In addition, the entire site had been covered, and this was now, again, some, at some point in the 20th century, the entire site had been covered by a plant nursery, an outdoor greenhouse where human remains were treated as mulch. The names and biographies of the 67 souls that are buried here may be muted by the absence of any inscribed headstones, but even their silent presence reminds us of the husbands and wives, parents and children, and black neighbors who were segregated in death as they had been in life. But we must also remember the context for the cemetery located in the grounds outside of the stone wall that enclosed the white bodies in the college cemetery, which was yet another layer of social injustice. In contrast, two miles from this spot, a group of African American women grew tired of burying their families in a segregated section within one of Charlottesville's public burial grounds. This would be the Oakwood Cemetery, the, the public burial ground. Instead, these determined mothers and daughters founded the Daughters of Zion Cemetery so that they could bury their dead on their own terms in their own sacred space. And this was back in 1873, decades before women were even allowed to vote. This struggle continues today with a group of similarly determined women who have founded the preservers of the Daughters of Zion Cemetery and su have successfully raised money to restore and remember the black community members that are buried within that sacred site. But there are other nearby African-American cemeteries that have a story to tell us. One block from here, just across the street and down a block, there are dozens of souls who were enslaved at the Piedmont Plantation who lie buried in a wooded area near the Gooch and Diller dormitories. And this site was only recently rediscovered in 1984. Across the street from where we enjoyed lunch this afternoon is another black graveyard where Catherine Foster, a free black woman, woman, labored during her life as a laundress and then buried her relatives in a family burial ground within a community once known as Canada. Taken together, these cemeteries reveal the large black community that contributed significantly both to the university and to local history. And yet these contributions are not always found in our history books which is one of the many reasons why visiting these sites is so important as a ritual of remembrance. Our presence here tonight is a powerful testament to the importance of the individuals buried in these sites. And I would encourage all of us to establish similar rituals back in our own communities. Rituals that incorporate walks through historic black cemeteries as a way to collect information about past residents and their achievements. Ironically, this suggestion dates back to the 19th century when American mothers were encouraged to take their children on walks through graveyards in order to learn from the moralistic headstone inscriptions. I can only imagine how well this would go over as a school field trip today for eight-year-olds. Nonetheless, uh, it was once considered very valuable and remains so today. And while most headstones in a cemetery emphasize the positive attributes of the deceased, don't feel like you have to use them to sugarcoat history. Use the moralistic inscriptions on a local white supremacist grave as a teachable moment, or hunt down the stones of veterans and talk about their service and sacrifice. Tonight, we join in fellowship to genuflect at the graves of unknown founders who helped to build and run the daily operations of Thomas Jefferson's university. 
Tomorrow or the next day, continue this ritual by visiting and remembering the dead that lie in historic African-American cemeteries in your own communities, and I promise you, you will learn, uh, you will learn uh, pieces of history that are new to you that reflect the contributions of African-Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rainville. Um, now, introduction of the keynote speaker uh, will be done by Dr. Tierney Fairchild, uh, Chair of the President's Commission on Slavery and the University's Community Relations Task Force. Tierney. First of all, welcome and thank you all for being here on behalf of the President's Commission on Slavery in the University and in particular our Community Relations Task Force that um, Dr. Edwards is a part of and many people I see here have been either a part of or come to some of the, thing, the events that we've had. Thank you for your engagement. Thank you for taking your time with us and allowing us to listen and thank you for your patience because this is a journey together and we can heal together we work together and this is a wonderful and very special event and I thank you all for being here. It is my very much distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. I have to put my old person's glasses on so I pretend that I'm young but I'm really not. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Delegate Dolores McQuinn. Delegate McQuinn represents the 70th district in the Virginia House of Delegates. She has served as chairman of the Richmond City Slave Trail Commission for over 10 years. The commission is dedicated to recognizing America's role in the slave trade and providing descendants of the African diaspora with the opportunity to research their own history. She fought for the preservation of the old Negro burial grounds, which was discovered during the beginning of the, re of the construction of a parking lot. Because of the work of Dolores McQuinn and the Slave Trail Commission, the city of Richmond has received the Bronze Slavery Reconciliation Statue, symbolizing the recognition of a triangle of the slave trade and the apologies received for slavery by the officials in England, West Africa, and Governor Tim McCain Tim Kaine of Virginia. Dolores was the 2013 winner of two African Diaspora World Tourism Awards for Outstanding African Diaspora Heritage Trail for the Richmond Slave Trade and for Slavery Reconciliation and the Healing Leader of Distinction. As well, she was a recipient of the 2013 Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities Humanitarian Award, as well as the 2017 Richmond African American History Month Award, and the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, and Richmond's Metropolitan Area Chapter 2017 President's Award. Dolores is very busy, as you can see, so her current commitments are on as executive board member of the East District Family Resource Center, Capital Area Partnership Uplifting People, chairman of the Richmond Slave Trade Commission. She's a member of the East Marshall well Street Well Planning Committee, and she was appointed by Governor McAuliffe to the Council of Bridging the Nutritional Divide, which works in the community to helping eliminate food deserts and to bring nutrition to our Virginia children. She's currently serving on the Appropriations, Transportation, and General Laws Committees in the Virginia House of Delegates. Please join me in welcoming Delegate Dolores McQuinn. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fairchild. I'm not sure who gave you all of that information, but let me know and I'll get it straight for the next time. <laughs> to God be the glory for great things he has done. I am so honored to be here and God is the center of my life. All that I am or ever hope to be is only because of him. And so I'm just grateful again, for his love and kindness and his tender mercies toward me. Not that I deserve it, just because he, because of his grace. 
Also to Dr. Martin and to, uh, in the absence of President Sullivan, to the faculty and staff and students of the university and to all of those who are attending tonight this very special time, this very special moment, not only in terms of what we are doing tonight, but in the life of the university. The invitation to address this crowd in celebration of such a significant milestone as this is deeply humbling. And for any institution, institution to have achieved its bicentennial is a rare testament to its own enduring spirit. And for the passage of time presents new challenges with the emergence of new era. So the millions of footsteps leading to the door of this university mark the generation of philosophers and scientists, educators, historians, politicians, and other leaders who are willing to stretch their minds to the human thought within the walls in search of hidden truth in the past, for the past. And so again, once again, I'm so glad to be here and I thank you for this opportunity. Just for a few moments, I, I think that um, I'll be, just, just for a scripture background, and as a Baptist preacher, we get a bit, put us behind a podium, we always have a scripture for you. So I just want to look at John 6.31, which says, Our father ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Our father ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven, bread of heaven to eat. Make no mistake, among us, even tonight, are the spirits of those who are at rest. But those spirits are a monument to the virtue of their perseverance, their tenacity, their strength, their courage. They're also a monument to us in terms of to encourage us during these times. When I just look at what, you are, what we are doing here tonight and how many lives have been affected, and just the whole issue of slavery, and how many individuals who had to go through such a horrible situation, how their lives were affected, and the impact even that it have, have on us today. Moments like that caused me to reflect, and, and I think it's something special in reflecting because in reflecting, I'm reminded of those of the past, of those of the present, and my hope for what will be occurring in the future. When I have the time to reflect, I reflect particular on slavery, and, and particularly because of the work that I've had the opportunity to do. Slavery, for all intents and purposes, was an institution and an infrastructure built to create wealth it was built to preserve a hierarchy of human value and to sustain the economic wealth of slave owners. With a constant evolution of more free labor in fields and homes, towns, cities, and yes, even universities. The industry of slavery was like cancer, with its roots deeply extended in the very fiber of American culture. Throughout the South, it touched every cell in our society with all prospering from this peculiar institution. While the free labor resulted in economic prosperity for the benefit of white slave owners and traders and their families, no one bothered to calculate the final cost. And ironically, the final cost has not yet been tallied. This evil system was costly though, as these efforts lasted for hundreds of years sustaining and maintaining the evil infrastructure of slavery. This human design tsunami was a system that rushed into the American's landscape as a forceful element that brought much destruction to America. But America's investment of hu human capital will clearly result in a monumental cost 
to the enslaved Africans. Fathers were taken from their families. Mothers separated from their children. Sisters and brothers departed. But also it was detrimental to slave owners and the degradation of Africa. The foundation was constructed with disregard to the toll on human life. The economy, economic gain by this institution blind the eyes of all who made an investment in this winning ticket. Many wanted it. It was entrenched. It was a systemic commercial undertaking. And the cost was great. The cost was pricely. And I don't think we were able to conceive, or those at that time were able to conceive the ways that it would be costly financially, socially, psychologically, and even politically. And in 2017, obviously, it's still costly. The architects of this institution closed his eyes, ears, and heart to the dysfunctionality of America's moral compass and the deteriorating consciousness of this nation. America dug deeper and deeper into the development of this infrastructure called slavery until she was at a point of no return. Unethical and oblivious to an unspoken word truth, she was separated by Christian values and suffering from moral maladies. An article by Tasha Williams in the Pacific Standard says, through forced labor, and their very existence, generation of enslaved Africans played an integral part in building the land of freedom and opportunity. And by the beginning of the 19th century, enslaved labor has systematically, both directly and indirectly, turned the United States into one of the two of the top economic powers in the world. Slavery was a temporary infrastructure, temporary because it was built on sand. It was designed to be built on a rock solid foundation. Suppose it was to have last forever, but there was one caveat that was not anticipated. And that was the determination and the tenacity of the human spirit of those enslaved was more profound than any chain that was connected to them. The other pieces, they had a God who sit high and looked low, and that God was greater. But this kind of infrastructure would have never survived. It was like the man again who built his house on the sand. Why? Because for those enslaved, many of them had tastes of freedom. And once the taste of freedom was in the soul, the longing for freedom could not be satisfied or settled in captivity. God had given them bread from heaven. And so the infrastructure and the institution of slavery began to dismantle day by day. And every time an effort was initiated to augment the institution of slavery with another law, God was moving by his power to let my people go. His mercy and his grace. In my reflection, there are moments also that I just dream. And one night I had a dream about this complicated and depressing and often depressing work. As I was falling asleep and I had a dream about a bridge, Dr. Edwards, and on that bridge was individuals standing in a place pouring foundation for the bridge. But in the middle was a small crowd and standing on the other side or the end of the bridge was a younger crowd. Uh, these many points on the bridge represented the past generation, the present and generations of the future. I watched as those on one end of the bridge was working aggressively as to get the work on the bridge finished, to get it completed. But the more they appeared to be working, the more stumbling blocks was placed in their pathway. But yet, they kept on working.
I didn't know who those individuals were. I didn't recognize their faces, but they were dressed as if they had endured much hardship. Their faces bore the look of hard times, and on the other end of the bridge, there was a younger generation. And their faces were fresh and new and bright, and, and they were dressed as if they were going somewhere. They appeared to be far away from the, those who poured the foundation. And there I was, standing with others about midway on the bridge. We were standing and watching the water flow under the bridge and, and just having informal conversation. And, and, and the first group that was pouring the foundation represented the past generation, those who were buried in the cemetery. But they were the conductors on the bridge. They were laying the foundation for generations coming after them to be free. They laid the foundation for us to have equal opportunity and justice. Yeah. And we are the benefactors of their strength tonight and the recipients of their courage. They could not reach the other side. They could not go to the other end, but I believe they worked so we could and that we would. The revelation came to me that those of us who are here today, this generation, they were the conductors, but we are the connectors. We're the connectors on the bridge and we're linking the past generation to future generation of young men and young women. Theodore Parker, a preacher and one who pursues social justice said, these words will be later paraphrased by Dr. King as well as President Obama. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it's been toward justice. They knew that justice would one day come. And even if they did not obtain justice, they were working, those who was in the past, the conductors were working that we might have justice. The foundation was built on their backs. The very cement of this university even absorbed the blood from their hands. As they suffered, the certainty of freedom was like oxygen in their souls. Their tears watered the soil day by day, yet they kept the freedom wheel turning deep in their souls. No one was there to tell them that the soil you are cultivating was helping to lay foundations for future generations. No one was there to encourage them or to tell them that their footprints of resiliency would be etched in the history of this university. And no one was there to let them know that they would be embraced and honored for their toiling, for their suffering, and for their pain. But they are our sheroes and our heroes. They are spirits of our mothers and fathers and grandparents who did the heavy lifting for those of us who are here tonight. They indeed built the landscape and labor under hostile and challenging situation. The rivers were raging for them and the clouds refused to allow the sun to peek through the horizon. It was relentless in revealing its darkness. Night for them was always and up for them was down. But yet there was a glimpse of freedom in their view, they saw those of us who were conductors. But I believe they saw something else. Because they were the conductors, we were the connectors, they could see the constellation, the light in the future, the light of another generation continuing the fight and gaining from the legacy and faith that was passed on. The other side of the bridge, the other end of the bridge, they were building it to somewhere. Dr. King said faith is taking steps even when you don't see the whole stairway. And then as they carried the bells of midnight of time, something else boiled in their souls. They weren't sure when, how or how, when or where, but I believe the shackles of their circumstances could not contain their desire for freedom and dignity. Yeah. Those of our past, 
they began to build the foundation for the bridge. And unlike the infrastructure of slavery, they began this ominous task of laying a strong foundation. The constitution of, institution, of this institution could not be persistent with human commodities. Time demanded the building of another kind of bridge of infrastructure. The conductors of the past, our ancestors, they understood the power of freedom. And so the longing for it remained deep in their souls and circulated through their veins. They wanted what they wanted and not only not only did they want it for themselves, they wanted it for future generations to come. Yeah. So in the dream, they were constantly working. They did their part. Again, that's why we're here. As the connectors, how do we continue their work and carry the banner for them? So that as they saw at a distance the constellation, that star far into the future, they could not complete their task. But tonight we are here thanking them, acknowledging and continuing to mark their life as relevant. As we celebrate tonight and commemorate, I would have you know that the bridge still needs to be completed. Amen. It still needs to be steady and stable, and one day, hopefully, in completion. It is incomplete, even after 200 years since those souls walked the grounds at UVA. It's still incomplete. Can we change the narrative? Will we change it? How do I know it's not complete? The bridge is not complete when Charlottesville and UVA became the major focus of racist groups such as neo-Nazis and white supremacists and the KKK embarking upon and protesting in mass numbers. It is not complete when I see men carrying tiki torches and shouting derogatory and demeaning words to others. No matter if we are Democrats, Republicans, or Independents, we should be about unity and not division. The bridge is not complete. It is not complete as connectors on this bridge. Let us build so that the constellation, the star that will be born in the future, another generation will arrive on the other side honoring us one day. Let us leave a legacy of encouragement and one of hope. The bridge is not completed, but let us do our part by continuing to fight against hatred and bigotry and injustice and inequality. Let us fight to guarantee democracy as a way of life for all citizens. Uh, the help and the conductors helped to get us from slavery through emancipation and Jim Crow and the civil rights. Tonight, what is our responsibility? The bridge is not in completion when young people, especially of African descent, are not enrolled in large numbers at schools of higher learning. Our honor and memory of those past conductors must be more in actions than in words. The discovery of their bones on these grounds now demand that we commit ourselves to stronger and more innovative ways to honor them. The bridge is still incomplete. Now what can we call the last 200 years properly? How do we encapsulate the dream, the teaching, and the reflection of our ancestors to recognize them for their tireless and thankless work? This, my audience, dear audience, is what we call a legacy. And as we light our candles, and perform the ritual libation, we shall reflect and we shall remember the innumerable blessings that have been carved out for each one of us. As you do so, ask yourself, what is it you want to embed in your own legacy, in that of the University of Virginia, in your home, in your relationship, and most importantly, in yourself? What will our successors hope 
to have achieved in the next 200 years. At this moment, we cannot answer with certainty, but together we can continue to lay the groundwork for an inclusive and equitable academic landscape, one that will rightly honor our ancestors and aspire our descendants to fly in the face of challenges. God bless you and thank you. You, we need to help complete that bridge. Ricky White and the Union Run Baptist Church, R.A.W. Praise, Total Praise Choir. Thank you. And Delicate McQuinn, uh, your message was awesome. One more round for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, tonight's uh, program is titled For Keep of These Grounds. And that phrase was excerpted from the poem Filled Work. It was written in 2014 uh, in commemoration of this, the University of Virginia African American Cemetery, by Brenda Marie Osby. Brenda Marie Osby is a poet and essayist and distinguished visiting professor, Africana Studies, Brown University, 2011 to 2015, 
and she's the Port Laureate Emerita of Louisiana. She couldn't be with us in 2014, but she is with us tonight. Brenda Marie Osby. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Vice President Martin. I would like to thank also um, Kurt Van Dyck, um, President Teresa Sullivan, and also um, Deborah McDowell, who's not with us this evening, um, but uh, who is um, very much responsible for my being here um, and for this being one of um, three commissioned poems that I've done in the state of Virginia. Um, and these commissioned poems are now the basis of a manuscript called Virginia Sweet. Um, field work. In commemoration of the discovery of the remains of 67 African Americans interred beyond the walls of the University Cemetery, University of Virginia. Quote, that excluding students, enslaved African Americans were the largest pre-Civil War population residing at the academical village. Field work. Remove topsoil. Cater close to the principle of uncovering both common and uncommon past. Monitor closely in slewing, slow dig and soft brushed stroke. Now inherent tools of this body of knowledge intending to reveal whatever of human society remains to be revealed beneath, below, tin, wood, and brick. Ceramic ware, long anonymous cloth, and bits of iron, nail, spindle and spoon, tooth, quarry stone, bone and shard, men, women, children, useful things of everyday life beneath, beyond. Cemetery, no doubt in other languages also, is a graceful word. Death, we know, and sometimes causes, multiple causes of said deaths. Burial, means or styles of conveyance to places of burial of those dead. Measuring proximity of bodies singly and adjacent or cutting one upon another. Tell something of various indicators of long time burial practice in specific or approximate or conjectured place. Cumulative patterns of expression and material culture of souls, however, is an area which neither this present and ongoing study nor any science we yet know of claims so far to be equipped to deal. Interviews with known or presumed descendants can perhaps expose basic knowledge, belief, practice, concepts of death, desire, afterlife, beyond. Slaves here are called servants. Many who write and talk such things do say that Mr. Jefferson himself did call it so. It does not change the conditions under which we labor within these bounds, the uses we are put to, the ways we die for keep of these grounds. Did call himself father to all this we build and tend. Did look on slavery, they like to tell, 
as but one necessary evil did not say the others, war may have. In our way, it is as children gone with tetanus and pneumonia, women gone birthing, strapping men felled down in typhoid or the consumption, Violet, William, and Boy Bacchus, Tessa's Hannah, Vanily smothered, sleeping, we all did hope, Strong Mike and Billy, Tom, young and handsome, then bloated over with filthy bile. Limus, old, but also here with us and not alone. Eliza and baby Eliza, almost together. Woman over broadest place, some over Mopan and Peraway. Unknown, they write and put away in ledger and book, unknown, but not to those who love and tend them in the end, not by us, not by rust-red earth, soft-brushed by hands that carry and tend and sometimes pray and sometimes not. As much science as we now possess, it is difficult to advise beyond further study. Determination for remains other than ancient bearing far more upon the living than we are at present prepared to suppose. 67 is no small number. Nor is the body neither less nor more than the soul's own passage. For here some have the one soul, and others the many. Some return straight away to ancestors, while others live on even as the body itself gives way. Such knowledge comes in those earliest nights when living and dead go to meet one another, go out of an evening to sit and talk good talk. These things are sacred. And it is worse than wicked to disturb those going to talk well with their own. Grave evil to prevent them from keeping good company with their own dead. In this place is wickedness unimagined, except to those who have no soul no dead to call home, no ancestor to guide and receive them. 67 is no small number. And no one of us can make a home where ancestors do not also live. It is well to consider that research design is one language, reverence another. It is well to consider how further study in concert with broader, nearer communities than these esteemed colleagues may impinge upon the potential weight of disinterment, of removing for analysis at this time remains largely anonymous yet long consigned. Time to come, drums yet may beat soft and low. Tessa's Hannah, Billy, strong Mike, beat soft, beat low. William, Tom, young and handsome still, Bacchus, Violet, beat soft, beat low. Liza and baby Liza, old Limus rooted deep as Cypress close by, surveying beyond what all remains of this green 
embowered wood. Sweet sleeping vanily, waking only to dream again. Feast days to come, beat soft, beat low. The evils of this place hardly more than memory trailing and neither slave nor servant then, but as we are. In these, our truest skins, together, soft now and low, inside this silty red and clayey soil. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda Marie Osby. Phil work, that's lovely. And now, uh, Reverend Almeda Ingram Miller, who is Minister of Worship, Music, and Fine Arts, Westwood Baptist Church, Richmond, Virginia, um, and the daughter of the late evangelist Maggie L. Ingram and the late Elder Thomas J. Ingram, uh, will lead us into a procession into the cemetery along with the Union Run Baptist Church. So you all may rise. that will come after us. We honor them tonight with this African libation ceremony. To conduct the ceremony, one needs water and three bowls. A black bowl that symbolizes the African people, a red bowl symbolizing the blood of our African ancestors, and a green bowl symbolizing love and life. For the libation to our ancestors, I will make declarations and pour water from the red bowl into the black bowl. After each declaration, the congregation shall repeat the word hotep, which means peace. To Almighty God, who delivered us from slavery to freedom, from death to life, and from oppression to liberation, who comforts us in our hardships and downfalls, who sustains, redeems, and heals us, and whose power is always with us, let us say, Hotep. Hotep. To the ancestors who have gone before us and who have created the path in which we follow, to our foreparents, those who struggle to find a proper place in this land, for our ancestors, who were considered less than human, but knew that they would see a better day for us, their children. For them we say, Hotep. Hotep. And now for the libation to our posterity, our children. For the libation to our children, I will make declarations and pour water from the green bowl into the black bowl. After each declaration, the congregation shall respond by saying Harambe, which literally means everyone work together. We call upon the spirit of our children and their children to forever witness what we have done. Let us all say Harambe. We call upon our children to learn from us strength, truth, 
reconciliation and love as they center their faith and hope in Almighty God. Let us all say Harambe. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for allowing us this time to honor our ancestors. Help us to continue to live our lives in ways that honor you and that bless others. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Amen. Oh, walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't, don't you, you get, get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Oh, walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Oh, walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Oh, pray together, children, don't you get weary. Pray together, children, don't you get weary. Pray together, children, don't you get weary. There's a great happy meeting in the promised land. Oh, walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary? There's a great happy me. I'm gonna walk and never get tired. Oh, I'll walk and never get tired. I'll walk and never get tired. There's a great camp meeting in the promise. Oh, walk together, children, don't you get. Oh, walk together, children, don't you get weary. Oh, walk together, children, don't you get weary. There's a great. Oh, 